Terry Smith, you've never been afraid to lock horns on a range of issues, whether that be accounting ratios, climate change or fiscal prudence or the lack of it. But as the manager of Fundsmith Equity Fund, you've recently targeted the UK fund management industry. What's going wrong? Uh, there are a lot of things going wrong. It's a question of how to limit the answer to you in many respects. Uh, the industry charges too much. Uh, I think that's clear. Uh, I would say the average investor who uh, invests possibly through an advisor and pays a fee, they use a platform to marshal their investments and then they invest in active funds, probably is incurring costs of around 3% uh, from that process. Uh, that's not including the fund manager's activity and dealing, which may add another percent or percent and a half. That's more than the income on either bonds or equities at the moment. Uh, that's being wiped out by the charges. You can just stop there in terms of the costs that the, uh, the industry is, uh, is incurring. And it's, uh, it's just a way of ensuring that investors can never get a satisfactory performance. You're quite famous for being sort of fairly inactive in terms of um, what you do with uh, the portfolio. You like to hold shares for the long term. Um, do you see that then as a template for the rest of the fund industry to give private investors a, uh, generally a better experience? Um, yeah, templates is a word in the news a lot about post the Cyprus, uh, but about whether or not it is a template for the future and so on. Uh, I think it should be a template probably uh, for the majority of, of fund managers. Not all. There's more than one way up the mountain. You can be very active and perform. I accept that. But uh, for the vast majority of people who would, I doubt, however, if it will be accepted. I think most people hold so many shares. Um, and the other thing is that quite a lot of people see their job as activity. So it's, it's being overactive, trying to um, time the markets and the such. And, and I, uh, I would imagine that you would say this is just, it's not worth the candle. It's an utter waste of time for the vast majority of people. I always say there are only two types of people who try and market time, uh, buy low and sell high, as they say. Uh, those who can't do it and those who don't know they can't do it. One of the desired outcomes of the Financial Services Authority's retail distribution review was to eliminate so-called commission bias when advisors are recommending funds to their clients. Do you think the RDR is going to achieve that aim? I hope it will achieve those aims um, because I think as soon as you allow uh, a fund to pay an advisor uh, some form of trail commission, you are always going to get the best paying fund recommended, not the best fund recommended. So I would hope for the sake of everybody involved, most particularly the investors, that it does. However, I've got relatively little faith in regulation saving us from almost anything. <laughs> Fund managers and institutional investors often pressure companies to release value through share buybacks. And they say that this is often a tax efficient way to do it. Do you agree with that approach? In generality, no. Um, companies can create value for shareholders by buying back shares. Um, there's a very simple yardstick for it, only if they buy them when they're cheap, when they're uh, trading lower than their intrinsic value. Uh, they can no more create value by buying those shares if they're not cheap than I can by buying them if they're not cheap in my fund because they're a buy and hold investor. They're not going, if they overpay for them, they're not going to on-sell them to somebody else at an even higher price. Um, and that frequently doesn't happen, I'm afraid. Uh, I would say quite a lot of share buybacks are done when shares are expensive and the only person who benefits is the exiting shareholder. I'd also dispute whether or not you can do distributions uh, tax efficiently. You can make a capital distribution. I've done it as a chief executive of a quoted company, Tullet Prebon in 2007. So tax is spurious as an argument. A lot of private investors are focusing heavily on income when income is actually quite hard to find. Do you think they're focusing too much on income? Yes, I think investors are. I mean, it's hardly surprising. We've got interest rates at 300 year low and they've been here for four years and uh, people who are completely dependent upon their income from investments, such as uh, retirees, uh, are obviously desperate for, uh, for a yield. But the trouble is that desperation is leading them to, to buy things that they probably shouldn't. Um, I think they're buying lots of income funds promising four and five percent dividend yields which aren't real. They're basically getting part of their capital back through the dividend and paying income tax for the, uh, the privilege of doing so. And they're buying lots of other things as well. I mean, junk bonds in America are now trading at sub 6% yields. This is unheard of. Uh, the, uh, you know, the debt of Bolivia is, uh, is just issues on a 4 and 3 quarter percent yield. Well, good luck if you think that that's acceptable uh, for a country which I think has probably spent more time in default than it has actually servicing its debt. Uh, so yes, I think people are just too focused on, on yield. They should actually focus on the total return from an investment, what's the whole return I'll get? And then if they need more than the, than the dividend yield, take some money out of the capital. That's a far more sensible way of approaching the problem. 
Some people might say that uh, your investment process is very much like Warren Buffett's. Uh, would you describe him as an investing hero? Uh, and are there any other people you really admire out there? Um, yeah, I mean, Buffett is definitely an investment hero for me and for an awful lot of other people. I think what we do is rather like what he did. Uh, interesting. I don't think it's how he runs Berkshire Hathaway now, uh, which is unsurprising given the amount of money that he's got. He can't. Uh, you know, when you get to whatever he's got, $160 billion, you can't do it. But if you go back to the early days of, uh, of his investment career at Berkshire Hathaway, the sort of things that he bought, the things like Coca-Cola and McDonald's and American Express and so on, do fit what we're after, the things that make their money from a large number of repeat everyday uh, transactions involving consumers. So, yeah, very much like it. And lots of others that I look at as well. Um, uh, if you look at the mentors of Buffett, people like uh, Philip Fisher, uh, wrote Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, or Ken Graham, who wrote The Intelligent uh, uh, Investor. Those, I think, are very good uh, tutors if you're looking for them. And there are others out there in the modern age. I mean, I had dinner with Jim Slater last night, who's also a bit of a hero in his, uh, in his way. I think you can learn from a great many people out there. Terry Smith, thanks very much for talking to us, and good luck with the fund.